Not too long ago, I made a video about the 4080 Super, the most controversial of NVIDIA's latest Super Series graphics cards. Controversial because, in oversimplified terms, it was just a spicier 4080 with a less ludicrous price tag, effectively replacing the regular 4080. The 4070 Ti Super also caught some strays because, well, it murdered the unassuming 4070 Ti. R.I.P. This video won't focus on either of those bloodthirsty monsters, and instead we're going to take a look at the 4070 Super, a card that didn't directly unalive anyone, as far as I know anyway, and gave gamers a legitimately exciting upgrade over its replacement at a somewhat reasonable price tag. But it has been a few months now, and things in the tech world tend to change. So while we're taking a look at the Asus Tough Gaming RTX 4070 Super, we're also going to dig into whether the 4070 Super still makes as much sense to pick up right now as it did when it first dropped. So, let's get into it. Right after a word from me. Yep, just me. If you want to support the channel, just keep watching, subscribing, liking, commenting, and all that good stuff. But if you want to go the extra mile, feel free to use my Amazon affiliate links in the video description to buy all of your things. It costs you nothing, but helps the channel out a bunch. Now, while the 4080 Super and 4070 Ti Super were pretty welcome additions to the 40 Series family, mostly due to the former's price cut, surprisingly, it was the 4070 Super that got the most praise. Which makes sense. Unlike the 4080 Super, which barely saw any real performance upgrades over the regular 4080, and the 4070 Ti Super, um, which did get a major upgrade or two, but didn't exactly blow anyone away, the 4070 Super snuck in to steal the show. While both the 4070 and 4070 Super are built on the same 8104 chip and share a big disadvantage, just 12 gigs of VRAM, something we'll be uh, discussing at the end of the video, they are not the same. The 4070 Super comes equipped with 7,168 shading units, almost 22% more than the 4070, along with similar bumps to Tensor Cores, RT Cores, L2 Cache, and a decent bump to base clock speed. That power bump does come at the cost of, well, power, with the 4070 Super hitting a TDP of 220 watts. But that's a pretty fair trade-off. And best of all, the 4070 Super landed at the same exact $600 launch price as the original 4070. Pricing has fluctuated a bit since launch, but at the time of filming, you can still pick up the 4070 Super for around the $600 mark, with the Asus Tough Gaming version here coming in at $660, or 18,000 Rand here in South Africa. That pricing was kind of sensible at the time since you're technically getting a faster 4070 for the same price as the original, which is great. But a few months and a sneaky relaunch from Team Red later, and just like the morning after those last couple of Jaeger bombs, it might not seem like the smartest choice anymore. But we'll get to that in just a bit. First, let's take a quick look at Asus's tough gaming take on the 4070 Super. Now, if you've already watched my video about the 4070 Ti version, or any video about the 4070 Ti Super version, you're in for no surprises. Almost all of the higher-end tough gaming cards are nearly identical, in some cases only differing somewhat in the cooling horsepower. And that's not a bad thing. While it's not my favorite design of the current gen boards, the tough gaming cards of this generation are iconic. The card is somewhat boxy and minimalistic compared to some other designs, but not enough to tip into boring. The almost fully grayed out aesthetic with the smooth matte finish is always a hit, and at the same time the reflective silver accents on the sleek black fans, the white, black and grey branding, the techie military like touches, everything just helps to keep things interesting. We still only have the one tiny lighting zone on the edge of the car to try to appease the RGB nuts like myself, but even though it's fully customizable and well diffused, this RGB nut is not appeased. The Tough 4070 Super is on the larger side, taking up a little more than three slots and measuring in at about 30 centimeters long, 14 centimeters wide, and 63 millimeters thick. So if you have a smaller case, you'd better get that measuring tape out. But with great size comes potentially great cooling capacity. Yeah, that's how that works. The card features a hefty heat sink with what looks to be six heat pipes running throughout, along with three of Asus's Axial Tech fans and strategic gaps in both the shroud itself and the backplate allowing for unimpeded airflow, this card should more than be able to handle the GPU itself. Asus also deserves some props for build quality here, where many of the other board designs this generation opted for plastic shrouds, Asus didn't skimp out and stuck with metal for the shroud and backplate, which levels up the overall feeling of quality by more than a few notches. Oh, and the card also ships with the most simple and useful little GPU support thingy that I've ever used that also doubles as a screwdriver. And to top it all off, the card features a pretty generous factory overclock right out of the box. 
Nice. Okay, now that we know what we're dealing with, let's put it to the test. At the heart of the test system is the Ryzen 7 7800X 3D running at stock settings, slotted into a Pro X670P motherboard, running 32 gigs of Gale's Evo 5 clocked at 6000 MHz CL32, Crucial's P5 Plus as the main drive, and it's all powered by Antec's signature 1000 watt power supply. So, let's roll the charts, starting with 1080p. Now, unfortunately, I don't have access to what I consider the 4070 Super's Nemesis, also known as the 7900 GRE, but both of the Team Red cards featured in these benchmarks should give us a decent comparison. I think cards like the 4070 Super are a little overkill for 1080p, since we're more likely to hit a CPU bottleneck at this resolution, but I'm showing the charts anyway, because I know some of you like big numbers, just like I do. And man, do we have some big numbers. At this resolution, only the absolute unoptimized mess that is Alan Wake 2 presented anything I'd consider a challenge for the 4070 Super. The rest of the titles comfortably ran at more than 100 FPS, with the majority of them leaning closer to or even higher than 200 FPS. Even at 1080p with higher settings in some heavily demanding titles, this is some impressive stuff. But that doesn't just count for the 4070 Super. With all the average FPS scores tallied up, the 4070 Super comes out ahead of all the cards minus its bigger and pricier big brother that shouldn't really be here, but it was by no means an easy dub. The 4070 Super managed a respectable 10.7% lead over AMD's 7800XC, but it only just outpaced the 6900XC by a mere 3.9%. But this isn't really a 1080p card, so let's move on to 1440p, a resolution a card like this should be perfect for. And lo and behold, perfect for 1440p it is. As before, the 4070 Super only ran into a challenge in Alan Wake 2, managing a 68 FPS average there, while other titles like The Last of Us, God of War, Cyberpunk, and Starfield proved to be a bit tougher to run too, managing averages between 100 and 110 FPS. Those are hardly bad numbers, and the fact that the card blew past those numbers in all the other games tested shows that it crushes 1440p gaming just fine. That being said, I was actually expecting it to perform slightly better here without the constraints of a CPU bottleneck. Even though it came out ahead of its relevant competition on the charts, and even improved on its lead over the 7800XC going from 10.7 to 11.3% faster, it lost ground to the 6900XC, landing at 2.8% faster, more than a percentage less than we saw at 1080p. This could be due to a bunch of reasons, but before we dig too deep, maybe the 4K charts will help make things a little clearer. Here we go. Okay, so as expected, 4K is still 4K. Much lower numbers across the board. But even so, the 4070 Super isn't exactly slacking here, managing playable and more than playable FPS averages in most of the games I tested, with the only game I'd label unplayable being Alan Wake 2 for more reasons than just low FPS, but that's just me. Just tone down one or two quality settings, which at this resolution isn't much of a downgrade, and I'd be more than happy to game at 4K with a 4070 Super. Now, beyond showing that the 4070 Super is a competent 4K card, I think these charts also highlight what I think is one of the card's biggest drawbacks, just 12 gigs of VRAM. Where the 4070 Super had a relatively big lead over the 7800XC at lower resolutions, that lead dropped by almost half to just 6.9%. And even more telling than that, instead of the 4070 Super again taking the lead from the 6900XC by a small margin, Team Red's offering turned the tables and outpaced the 4070 Super by 3.1%. And what do both AMD cards have in common? Yep, 16 gigs of VRAM. <laughs> but more of that at the end of the video. Now rasterization is still king overall, but when it comes to modern cards, it's not the full story. So let's move on to ray tracing and upscaling performance. And as expected, just like the 4080 Super, the 4070 Super is just built different than AMD's offerings when it comes to ray tracing. In all but Far Cry 6 and the Resident Evil 4 remake, where there was some decent competition, the 4070 Super easily outpaces the other cards in the stack, and we're not talking small margins here. Minus the two aforementioned titles, the 4070 Super came out ahead of the 6900 XT by 31%, going all the way up to 158%. And that includes results with and without AMD's FSR and Nvidia's DLSS turned on. And even though AMD's frame gen tech wasn't available during testing, Nvidia's was. And with that flipped on, we saw huge gains in both Alan Wake 2 and Cyberpunk without any perceptible hit to input latency. Now during all this testing, the Asus Tough Gaming 4070 Super kept its cool, only hitting a max temp of 56 degrees C and a max hotspot temp of 68 degrees, 
all while only hitting a max fan speed of 1861 rpm, or about 58% of its max speed, which was hardly audible over the rest of the components. The card maxed out its core clock at 2865 MHz, with an average core clock just 15 MHz lower, and it drew 221 watts under max load, making it the second least power hungry card on the charts. Asus's Tough Gaming 4070 Super is a solid card in every aspect, other than RGB of course. And from what I've seen, it's one of the coolest under pressure too. If you're looking at getting a 4070 Super, I'd recommend adding this one to your top three list. That said, should you consider getting a 4070 Super at all? That's the real question here. And if you've been picking up on the not so subtle hints throughout this video so far, you'll know that it's not a simple question to answer. Unless, of course, you're dead set on upgrading to or sticking with NVIDIA. And there are a bunch of entirely valid reasons to do so. The biggest would be their much better ray tracing performance and their superior, for now, upscaling and frame generation tech, along with a few other mostly software centered advantages. And if we're purely looking at NVIDIA's current gen stack, the 4070 Super almost couldn't be more perfectly positioned. It's faster than the regular 4070 by just enough to justify saving up a little longer for the Super, but priced low enough to make the jump to the 4070 Ti Super, coming in at around 800 bucks, a much harder sell. But if you're not entirely green pulled and just want the best bang for the buck GPU, regardless of which massive corporation makes it, then things get a lot more interesting. As we saw in the charts, the RX 7800 XC wasn't quite able to keep up pace with the 4070 Super, with the Super beating it by as little as 7% and by as much as 11% depending on the resolution and ignoring RT performance. But as of right now, the 7800 XC can be had for about 500 bucks, making the 4070 Super about 20% more expensive. But I don't really want to focus on the 7800 XC. I'd much rather focus on the most direct competitor the 4070 Super has, the 7900 GRE. Now, obviously I didn't have one on hand to test, but I did have a 6900 XC, which beat the 4070 Super at 4K and was outpaced by it in the other resolutions by only three to 4%. Combining that info with info from other reviewers and sources tells me that the 7900 GRE should just about outpace the 4070 Super in most non-RT, non-upscaling scenarios by a handful of percentage points. Which means that the 7900 GRE, which can be found for as little as 520 bucks at the time of recording, will get you, at the very least, about the same rasterization performance as the 4070 Super, while coming in at 80 bucks or about 15% less. Along with that discount, you're also getting four more gigs of higher bandwidth VRAM, which as our benchmarks show, does matter at higher resolutions, especially as games become more demanding. That's some pretty compelling competition right there, and maybe it'll be enough to nudge Nvidia to cut prices even just a little bit, please. Competition aside, now might not be the best time for any GPU upgrade, 4070 Super or otherwise. I am recording this before Nvidia's Competex presentation, so I can't be 100% sure, but I'd be legitimately shocked if Jensen reveals any details about the RTX 5000 series this soon. But even so, Nvidia's next gen gaming cards are coming and they might be coming as soon as late this year or early next year. I would personally hold off on upgrading until we get some concrete, confirmed details for those cards. But then again, even though I'm lucky and patient enough to be able to wait, I understand that many of you aren't, and I wouldn't judge anyone for not being able to wait another five to seven or so months for a new card. And that about wraps it up. Even though it has some stiff competition to deal with, and the timing isn't exactly super in its favor, the 4070 Super is still an impressive chip. It'll get you more than playable frame rates at whatever resolution you're rocking, has some major RT and upscaling advantages, like among other exclusive features, and it's even decently power efficient. Now, if Nvidia could only get that pricing a bit lower, they'd have a real winner here. And yeah. Thanks to everyone who made it this far into the video. Go ahead and like, comment, and get subscribed if you want more videos like this. And if you've made up your mind on any of the parts mentioned in this video, or anything else for that matter, feel free to use my Amazon affiliate links in the description down below if you wanna help the channel out. Yeah, I'll catch you all in the next one. Cheers.